I want to welcome you to this Profile in Color, a conversation with the Honorable Reverend Michael E. Haynes, uh, Pastor Emeritus of 12th Baptist Church. Um, this is um, very exciting um, for me for a number of reasons. Um, very recently, I had the opportunity of carrying on a conversation with Reverend Han Haynes while we were on a panel together at Dana-Farber for um, a celebration of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Michael Curry was also there as head of the NAACP. And as I began um, asking him questions about his life and his ministry, um, I realized that it would be a wonderful conversation that others might want to listen in on, as well as an opportunity to record him for the museum, uh, for our archives, and for posterity uh, on, on a number of subjects. So I want to welcome you, uh, and thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you, Beverly. I'm not a journalist, so this really is a conversation, but boy, do I have a lot of questions I would love to ask. Um, I'm going to ask you to uh, join me later in questions uh, when, when I have um, exhausted my curiosity, I might say. First, I want to ask you about um, how you feel sitting in this African meeting house. You are on the board of the museum for many years, and now you're returned to this place restored. What are you thinking? I reminisce tonight when I approached the modernity on the outside, and I remember the first time I came after it opened after the history of the Jewish synagogue here, and I came in and walked around, and I was just feeling bricks on the outside, thinking what I had read that these bricks were made by the hands of s freed slaves. And I recognized uh, the history that tied who I was then to the history of the meeting house. And all I could think about were those people who worshiped here who came out of the little, little uh, alleyway down the road from the black settlement coming in this place to worship and I thought of a family that was still in 12th Baptist Church, a lady by the name of Ruth Lombard, whose family had come historically out of this place. So it was a great feeling for a Boston-born kid to be able to come into a place where forebears worshiped and where they fought for the liberty and the rights of people in color. It was. It was sacred, it was special, it was almost unbelievable. It was like moving, it was like getting into a movie. And tonight it's almost like coming into that movie again. And as you explained to me, the, the significance of the lights and everything else and the floor had that same feeling. I wonder what those who walked across these floors would say to us tonight so many years later. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I should explain, the floors are from the Revolution. They are from Old West Church. Um, they built a new sanctuary in 1806, so this church body, the African Baptist Society, bought this wood from Old West and created these floors. So while the building is 205 years old, the floors are about 275 years old. So. Um, there's a lot of history, right. history in these in these floors. Sure. Um, you've said that you, um, a kid from Boston, growing up in Roxbury. Your parents were immigrants. Uh, tell us about their journey to Boston. Well, my parents came towards the turn of the century uh, to Boston, and as I've gotten older, as I've come close to the close of my journey here, I'm reflecting over my journey and reflecting over their journey. There's an old song that comes out of, the, out of the black church, one of the specials out of the black church written by a black Methodist preacher back earlier than that time says, we will understand it better by and by. Mm -hmm. And I'm beginning to understand 
so many things better as I get older. And my parents came, I guess, like a lot of, lot of so-called immigrants looking for gold in this promised land, looking for, looking for hope. But as I look back upon it now, I think they, they found a lot of pain and a lot of discouragement, but they kept, they kept moving forward. They came just on the eve of the Great Depression. So uh, I became a child of the, of the Great Depression, and things were so bad at that period in time that almost everybody that I knew, uh, red, yellow, black, brown, and white, Irish, Jewish, and, and Caribbean and African American, so many of us had to turn to public welfare to survive. Mm -hmm. And I reminisced on that factor a lot of times later in the, in the House of Representatives when certain representatives would be knocking people who were on welfare. But most of the people I knew whose families had to be on welfare uh, during that time uh, looked forward to the day when they could get off of welfare mm -hmm. and meet their own needs. Almost everybody that I knew, I didn't know anyone that wanted to stay on welfare. Everybody wanted to get off of welfare. So my parents did. They worked. My father had a thing. He was, he was trained to be an, an, an automotive engineer and uh, came here and had difficulty finding a job. He did have a good job for a little while at Standard Oil Company of New York's branch, I guess in Riviera, Chelsea, somewhere out there near the harbor, and uh, lost, that, lost that job. But from that period on, my father always, he said, there's nothing, nothing beats an honest dollar. And he would always work two jobs, practically all of his life. My father always had two jobs. The Depression did its own job on him in many, many ways. He used to tell me stories about what it was when, when uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt created the, uh, the WPA Works mm -hmm. Progress Administration, and they provided jobs for people. And he said the job that he was given during the Great Depression, he would have to work on one of the sanitation trucks. Most of the other guys on their sanitation trucks all came from Ireland. He said, but his job, his assignment was to pick up all the dead animals. This was the job that he got. He had to pick up the dead, dead animals. As time went on, he would get, take any honest job, nothing beats an honest dollar, he would say. Take any job he could get, often work two jobs. He'd be coming in the house around 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon and had a saying, uh, me and my brothers tease one another about it. My father would say, from work to work. Mm. He'd grab something to eat, and he'd be, he'd be gone, he'd be gone to, that, to that evening job. But he always worked. He always challenged all of us, all of us boys. To, we all had to start working uh, be, before, we, before we got to be 12. You had to be 12 years old to get a, to, to get a license to shine shoe, shoes. Mm. You had to be 12 years old to get a license to, uh, to, to, to sell the newspapers. Well, I, I chose to sell newspapers. My brother Roy chose to shine shoes. And we had to go down to what was then called Continuation High School. Later on, it became Brandeis High School. You go down there, you sign up, you, and, you, and you, you get this job. But before that, I think all of us boys, my, there were four boys in our household, and all of us learned to work in the, either in the Jewish synagogue directly across the street from our house or in, or in the Jewish store at the bottom of the street. Mm -hmm. So uh, industry, and uh, later on, I, I didn't know, I didn't have very much knowledge of the Caribbean much of my life. I really didn't have much interest in the Caribbean much of my life. I think I, like a lot of uh, uh, first generation kids, you, you just try to become as Americanized as, mm -hmm. as quickly as you get Americanized. But somewhere along the way, uh, later on, my mother never got back to, to the Caribbean uh, after she married and had these boys. And when she was somewhere in the, in the, in the 60s, she said, I want to go home one time before I die. And the usual thing in my house, she'd say, and one of you boys. And usually when my mother said, one of you boys, it usually ended up being this, <laughs> usually ended up being this boy. And uh, uh, fortunately, at that time, I was, in the, I was in the legislature right back here. And uh, it was very, very easy back in the 60s. You, you, had your own, uh, you, you had your own staff person that would take care of traveling. And so I was going to prepare for my first trip to the to the Caribbean, to the, island, to the island of Barbados, with great anticipation. And uh, at that time, the consul from Barbados was, uh, was Victor Bino. And so I went to him to talk about it. I said, I've never, I've never been to the Caribbean. I've never really been very interested in it, but I got to go. And I said, I think my mother's people live out in the woods someplace. They don't, I don't think they've got a toilet. And <laughs> I said, I don't, don't want to stay out there in a sugar cane field someplace, find someplace for me to stay. 
and uh, which, which Victor Bino did. He, placed, he, he told me about a lady that was running her own, her own beach house and uh, right on one of the main thoroughfares, St. Lawrence Gap in Barbados. And I never forget, never forget that trip. We arrived in Barbados at night. They had an old airport. It was a very old airport, and there was a platform outside of the airport. And I remember getting off the plane, and it wasn't like, it wasn't like Logan. The planes are out there, and you walk a long distance, and you come into this, to, this, to this old uh, airport headquarters, and you see all these people standing up on the balconies up there. And so I guess all of, all of my mother's family, and she came from a, a clan called Paines, and all of my father's family came from a, a triplicated uh, clan called the, the Haynes, the Howards, and the Nichols. And, and I looked up there and I see all these people on one side, the Haynes clan and the Payne uh, clan on, on, on the other side. And uh, th this was a, sa a Saturday night. And I spent a little time meeting and government officials came in because I was a member of the legislature. Photographers came in and so I, I, I became a celebrity in Barbados. Mm. But that, that, that first night after, after my relatives dumped me off at uh, Mrs. Maitland's uh, Andrea on Sea, which there's a black lady had developed this, uh, she had three buildings, two buildings at the time. And later on she developed three buildings and now it's, it's been commercialized. But uh, brought me to this place where I was gonna stay for the night and the, that Sunday morning I got up and took a walk down the road and I looked at the colors, the flowers and the plants and the shrubs. I said, my goodness, this is the nearest thing to heaven I've ever witnessed. <laughs> and, and I immediately, that first trip, I think the date was 19, might have been 1969. I think they got the independence. Someone for, Carol, when did you get your independence? 1966. 66, that's what I thought, 66. So this was 69. Mm -hmm. And from, from that on, 69, that night, when I walked down that road that Sunday morning, looked at the trees and the shrubs and the plants and every colors, and I walked over to, walked over to the ocean. I said, man, this is, this is, this is as close to heaven as I've been. And I became, I became a West Indian from that. <laughs> I became a West Indian from that. From that day on, I'll never, never forget it. And this, this lady, a very interesting lady, I, had, I was having gastrointestinal problems at that time, and she made a special diet, and she, she, she developed this, uh, this, this uh, place called Andrea and C, right on, right on the main gap. It's, it was like being at, at Columbus, Columbus in Mass, you know, back in 1945. This was, mm. this was where the clubs were, the excitement were, mm. and I'm, I'm, I'm living, on this, living on this gap. And uh, I walked around, looked at the homes of, the, uh, uh, of the, those who were still controlling the economy, and I walked back up in the village and looked at the, looked at the homes of, the, of those who were struggling uh, mm -hmm. for, the, for their rights. And it was quite a revelation for me. It helped me to understand my parents uh, all the more. It helped me to understand immigrants all the more. And to this very, very day, up until, up until yesterday morning, I was coming downtown, and uh, there were two ladies behind me, and, and they were... One was standing very pretty close to me, talking to one on the other side, and they were speaking a language that I did not know. So I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at them, trying to figure out what language are they speak, and I couldn't. And then that word just came to my mind: immigrant, immigrant, immigrant. Mm. And the thought just came to my mind: we are a nation of immigrants, although there are some people who forget that they are also immigrants mm. that think they own this nation of immigrants. Mm. And uh, so. That lesson keeps coming to me. So that was my first entree into the little island, little teeny island of, of Barbados, uh, I guess uh, 21 miles long and 14 miles wide. There's no place that you can't get in a half an hour if you just be patient. But those who control the economy tells everybody they have to have a car or two cars in the family and pollute the air with uh, noxious gases and everything else. Hmm. So that was my entree to, uh, to, to Barbados, and it helped me to understand my I understand my father and, and my mother and their families and their background all the more. And I know the first Sunday I went to the church, uh, uh, a church not, not too much larger than this, way out in the country. They were country people, way out in the country. And I went to church and I was just sitting around. I was sitting with my mother's sister and I'm sitting around looking at people. I'm looking and I bent over and I say, who's that, who's that man over there? He looks like my father. She said, that's, that's your cousin John. And over there, over. So it was quite an entree to see, but they came, they came to America looking for better opportunities because the stigma, the, the stigma of the slave trade uh, was, was still so deeply implanted 
in that island, like most of the islands of, of the sea, mm. of the ocean, all across this world. And, and uh, they came looking for, looking for better opportunity, but they struggled. And they, and they really struggled forever. And the, 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 uh, toward, my father died in, uh, I think, 1959, my father died. But they had purchased a cottage on a, on a little street called Haskins Street. And uh, a little six-room cottage. And I understand that they were not supposed to be able to buy this cottage. And uh, that a number of the homeowners had, had uh, band together so that no people of color would be able to move in. But uh, next to us was, was, was an, the Kellys lived on one side, and, and the Gervais, French Canadians, lived next to us. And then the, the Callahans and the Egans and Mrs. Campbell uh, lived on there. And there was a whole stretch of uh, predominantly Irish Catholics on that side, and just one Jew, Jew remaining at number 30. And I guess this was the time of the migration away from Lower Roxbury of Jewish people. And Mr. Baker, this Jewish man, as my mother and father told me this story, he not only sold his home to my parents, but he helped my parents to get that, to get that mortgage, mm. uh, which was kind of a parent. And some neighbors were pretty cursing him out uh, for doing this because they did not want us. At that time, there were, there were three black families living on Haskin Street that I can remember vividly very well. And, and this is a part of unique history. Uh, one, was, one family was the Benders. And, Mr. Benders drove a, drove, drove a limousine. Later on, I, I used to think it was his limousine. All of us thought this was Mr. Benders' car, but we found out that he was, he was, he was, he was riding a car for an undertaker, but he parked it in front of his, parked it in front of his door. Uh, Mr. Benders, they owned a beautiful little home in a little strip, and then uh, diagonally across the street from Mr. Benders was, was, uh, let me, let me, was Mr. and Mrs. Scott. And as I can recall, they either had a horse-driven uh, van and later had an automobile. And I come to find out later that this Mr. Scott is, would, would, would be the grandfather of, of the husband of the president of, of Wheelock College. And that, 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 factored, that factored right into, right into the uh, black history in, in Boston. Uh, because uh, Mr. Scott of Haskell Street, his son, his son married uh, a woman married a woman whose mother and father uh, had migrated out of the South, and the wife had the first, first uh, hair supply story, store in the black community called the Deco, Deco Hair Supply. And uh, this Deco Hair Supply was located on, on the uh, north, northeast corner of Cabot Street. Mm. And then it moved to the north to the southeast corner of Cabot Street. And then it moved, this, this, this is important history. <laughs> then, it, it moved, <laughs> then it moved from, from that corner, it moved up two blocks on Ruggle Street, it moved up Ruggle Street towards Washington Street, and uh, Mr. Scott acquired a three-story building that used to be apartments overhead and, and retail on the, on the street level. And he turned that into the Deco uh, hair supply, and his wife, ran the Deco Hair Supply, and he, he, ran, he, he played his role. But Mr. Scott eventually became, while I was still a kid, he became, he became the Republican Shag Taylor. Can I get a witness? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Scott became the, shag, the Republican Shag Taylor. He was the go-to man by the Republican politicians to the black community. And I can remember my brother, my older brother Douglas, who was about ten years, a little, little over ten years older than I. I can remember him going to, to talk to Mr. Scott in order to get a job. So there were two, there were two people that black people needed to talk to if you wanted to, if you wanted to penetrate the, these, uh, these, these positions that were controlled by the controlling factors of the of the city. And, and, and back in the '30s, this would this would be. Uh, the school department, the fire department, the police department were controlled predominantly by Irish mm -hmm. at the time. And so you go to Shag Taylor. I was just thinking about it on, on yesterday. I don't know, if, Louise, if, if you thought about it too, but I was thinking about it uh, the day before yesterday at, at Willis, Willis Saunders funeral. I just sat there watching, looking at the black police, listening to the conversations about, and all I could think of, because you remember looking back to my childhood when I, when I only knew of three 
three black police officers, and that becomes kind of important up here too. One was, one was a guy by the name of Shelburne, and it, it's, it's sort of incidental that uh, the reception for the Willis Saunders funeral was held at the Shelburne Community Center. But John Shelburne, the, the athlete, had an older brother who was one of those first black police officers. And he eventually, he, he lived on, on Laurel Street. I, I could see Mr. Sh Mr. Shelburne walking up Tremont Street, and an officer named Banks walking up Tremont Street. And then a little later on, we, we got the, 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 the twins, the, the two brothers, the McLean, yeah. McLean brothers. I think they came from Hubert Street or William yeah. Street. But in order to penetrate, and, and get a job in them, you, 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 could go, you could go to your local politician. And when I was a kid, it probably was either the Craven, the Cravens or the Glen. There was one other predominant, Cravens, Glen, there's another family that slips my 80, 84 years and three months mine. <laughs> they won't, the re, re, re won't, won't come there. But uh, the, you know, you, you'd go see Shag Taylor if you wanted to make the police department. I was thinking this, this past Sunday, I, I've been doing I've been doing a circuit of, of visiting visiting churches, and this past Sunday I, I knew I was going to go to to uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church this past Sunday, and as I was driving uh, towards Ebenezer Baptist, I just reflecting, and I, one of the largest funerals that this one of the largest funerals that this place had was uh, at uh, Ebenezer Baptist, Baptist for Shag Taylor. Uh, this was where his funeral, but I never I. I Reflect the day when Shag Taylor's funeral came and every black police officer marched up Tremont Street. And, and, and I thought about it. So you'd go to Shag Taylor in his drugstore, and if you were older and had a pass or paid whatever it cost, Mark, I don't know how much you have to pay to get into the Pioneer Club, but if you get into the Pioneer Club uh, to visit Shag Taylor, but you go to Shag Taylor. But then if the Republicans were in control, you'd, 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 you'd go to Mr. Wilfred Scott at the Deco Supply place to talk to him, and he'd be the intervener. Interesting pages, interesting pages of history. And all this factored in on, on, on my father and, and my mother and my family over, over the years. Mm -hmm. And later on, I became the beneficiary of some of the assistance of some of these very same, uh, same people. Because Shag Taylor, Shag Taylor belonged to 12th Baptist Church uh, on, on, on the record. I mean, on the record, that's where he belonged, <laughs> to, 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 to 12th Baptist Church. But by that time, 12th Baptist Church had gone through its own uh, crisis of building and ended up on, on, on Warren Street. And they wanted, to have it, they wanted to have it closer to Roxbury in the south end, and Ebenezer was a, was, was a larger church. But looking back upon my parents, looking back upon my family, I think of these, these luminaries, these people that, it, that had their fingers on the political pulse and the economic pulse that was so important to the community. So how, how did this play into your education? How did you manage, how did you use this network for that, your that's educational a, that's advancement? A, that's a story all in itself. That's another book. <laughs> 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 that's another book. Uh, that takes you to so many, so many <laughs> trips. Uh, my, my mother and father were influenced by uh, uh, understandably, the Anglican Church, which was the state religion. But the Anglican Church was racist, even in the islands, whether it be Jamaica, Barbados, and, and you know, they, they, they were racist. And, but the, the Moravian Church, uh, uh, the Europeans, they sent missionaries to a lot of these islands, especially the English-speaking islands. They sent missionaries into these English-speaking islands uh, to minister to the slaves. So my parents went to a, went to a Moravian school and thusly, they also went to the Moravian Church. If you went to the if you went to the uh, nearby uh, Episcopal Church, if the if the if the if the white folk left any seats, you might get a seat. Mm -hmm. But you certainly had to surrender your seat. This was early in the uh, eighteen hundred era. And uh, so, when when they came to the United States, they 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 they'd come out of an Anglican Moravian, uh, very traditional uh, liturgical ch sort of church worship. And someone had told them that a lot of people were going to the Methodist church, that they'd find the Methodist church like home. And the first, uh, the first, first uh, Sunday night that my mother's brother had come to the country, I don't know how long they'd been in the country, my parents, but the brother came and they were going to go to visit a church. So they, the nearest Methodist church was Columbus Avenue Zion Church. And they were living on, I think, Woodbury Street, a little street off of Charmant Avenue. And they walked across Hammond Street. They went to Columbus Avenue Zion Church for evening service when the church was closed. And so they started back home, 
came up, uh, up, up Hammond Street and headed towards home, and they, and they heard some singing. This was an evening time, and they realized that my, my parents had not been in the country too long, and, and their brother, who eventually uh, uh, became Bishop E.T. Payne in Boston, this was his first uh, Sunday in the country, and uh, they hit Charmant Avenue heading towards Woodbury Street, and they heard singing in a mission. And so my mother's brother, as the story goes, uh, said, that must be a mission down there. Let's go. And my mother agreed with her brother we would go visit this mission. And my father says, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> and my father went home, and my mother and her brother went to this mission at 593 Shamit Avenue. And we heard it for the rest of my life. Well, by, the time my mother, by the time my mother came home from church, it wasn't the same woman that my father had married. <laughs> I guess that, that very night, she, she, joined, she joined the Pentecostal church and her, and her brother. Wow. Of course, the rest of the Haynes were going, you know, we're, we were going over to St. Cyprian's, uh, the Anglican church, but, uh, but uh, uh, this is what my, my father had to deal with. So I, I tell you that story, what does that have to do with education? <laughs> So I, I had to go to Sunday school, you know. By the time I was, I wasn't born at that time, but by the time I was born, my mother was entrenched now uh, in a Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. And by this time, it had gravitated from 593 Charmant Avenue, like this mark, 593 Charmant Avenue to, the, to 7 North Heald Street, which was upstairs over Estelle's. Mm. So, this is, uh, uh, this, so this is where I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to Sunday school. My brother Roy would be belly, so I want to go to, I want to go to St. Shippens with the, with the sophisticated Haynes's. I don't want to go uh, to 7 North Field Street. So I say all that to say this. Early in my life, I started getting this, this, this uh, deposit of, 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 of faith, this recognition of, of, of God, this need for God in my life. And, and uh, at, at, at an early age, I made a commitment to, uh, to get baptized and try to be a Christian. I don't, I don't think it, because I had any noble ideas. I think I was just scared of the idea of hell <laughs> and, <laughs> and, 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 and burning throughout eternity. But uh, at 12, I decided I was going to be a Christian. In that process, I, 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 I moved into a verse from the Hebrew Scriptures in the book of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And my mother's brother, who had eventually uh, moved up the ranks in the Pentecostal church and became a, a pastor, had his, own, had his own church and everything else. So I was entrenched with this uh, deep sense of the, the relevance and the importance of recognizing this as God. And, and, and I, I learned at a young age, and I understood it better. There used to be a sign uh, outside of People's Baptist Church way back when I was young, because I used to come up from English High and walk home from old English High down on the south end. And there used to be a they used to change these signs in front of People's Baptist Church, and it was a sign that the, uh, the, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and that thing stayed in my mind. And so I, I, I tried to, at a, at a teenager, I tried to, to, to bring faith and scripture into, into my life. And, uh, and there, was a, there was a big religious movement in the, in, in the New England area around the late 30s, uh, older people would understand it. Uh, uh, a gentleman who would uh, probably made T.D. Jakes and all these other guys look like pikers uh, mm -hmm. came, came to Boston. He was an Amy Zion evangelist named William Frederick Fisher. And he turned, mm -hmm. he turned religion upside down in Boston, 1934, 35, 36, mm -hmm. holding uh, uh, 5 a.m. Uh, resurrection in Symphony Hall, uh, the open tomb of Jesus Christ, Layman Tracy Hunter, wrote all of this music. He was a outstanding. He wrote all the music for this thing that was put on at Symphony Hall for a number of years. Then it went to Jordan Hall. Then it went to uh, what, what uh, a theater on, on, on uh, Huntington Avenue near the conservatory. I forgot what it was called. Went to that theater and, until he built his own church up here in, on Kenilworth Street with his stage for this thing. But this man had a big influence, and he's the one that brought gospel music. So all of this, all of this, affected all the families. And I come out of a jazz, jazz family and a religious family. 
how the two met. My father was a musician. My oldest brother became a musician. Next brother became a musician. So jazz is in our house and, 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 and gospel's in our house. And all this is fusing through my head, all this music. My father's a musician. My older brother's a musician. The next brother becomes a musician. And all this is rolling in my head, all of this music. And then the war comes. I'm in Boston English High, and Maya Falvey, God rest his soul, wherever it is, Maya Falvey says, uh, quit school and get a job. I was a marginal student. And at Boston English High in the 1940s, uh, uh, you, either had to, you either had to be from an, an upper, upper class bourgeois black Republican family from Humboldt Avenue, or you better be a good athlete. <laughs> you, know, you, better, you, better be, you better be a good athlete. Well, I didn't come from an upper class Republican family living up on, in Humboldt Avenue, and my family were immigrants, and me and my brothers really didn't want our mother or father ever to have to come to school because the, then we have to deal with the fact that they had this accent and the teachers go look at these, these immigrants with these accents, mm. funny. So we didn't want my mother and father to come to school and some of those uh, people out of the Caribbean had, had some, some rather wild ways. Uh, uh, I remember when I was in, uh, in <laughs> elementary school, William Bacon School, I won't call the girl's name because she's still living, but she was, she, she was in my room. She was in my room in the school and her West Indian mother came up to school from the teachers <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and in front of the class, <laughs> in front of the class, uh, she had to tell what she did. Why did the mother have to come to school? And the mother goes in the bag, in a pocket book, she takes out a belt, and she proceeds to, proceeds to, beat, her, proceeds to beat her in class. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this had to be, this is 19, like 1930s now, 1930s. So uh, I know that my mother and my brothers knew that my mother had this little knack that if you did something wrong, uh, my mother was always ironing when she was home. We were, we were the cleanest, we were the cleanest <laughs> things in the, in the pike. They, people used to talk about they had dirty, dirty windows and dirty curtains. Uh, not, not in our house. Mm. My mother was always cleaning. She would be always ironing, always washing clothes and ironing. But if she had, a, if she had any issue with any of her sons, uh, the kitchen's here, and the dining room is back there, and the living room's up there, and her ironing board is just outside of the kitchen, kitchen door. And, and my mother would wait until you had some reason to go into the dining room. And my mother would loosen the iron cord from the, from the iron, and, and she came out of the door. My mother would go, don't, don't you let me wait all these things out of the door. And I, I remember one day, uh, my brother Vincent, who was older than, older than I, who went into photojournalism, my brother Vincent, he was the, there was an athlete there. Douglas was, the, Douglas was committed to, to music. Vincent was the, committed to sports first and then, and then music. Roy was completely committed to music, completely, absolutely. And uh, then I was caught in the, uh, in, 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 in the middle, of all, middle of all of this. But uh, down at in, in English High, I, when I, I, I said, well, I'll try to run track. Uh, and uh, I didn't do very well. And Mr. Arenberger, Unless you, were, unless you were good, unless you were a good black kid, he didn't care about you. Maya Falvey, you know, looked, looked at my grades, you know, uh, looked at my grades. I, I mean, the only thing I knew, my mother said, don't bring red marks home. You know? <laughs> she, 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 knew that a, she knew that a red mark was bad. She knew that a red <laughs> mark was bad. Don't bring red marks home. You know? So I knew that I couldn't bring red marks home. But I didn't know about I didn't know about the other marks, you know, and I, I got a lot of the, I got a lot of the lot of the lot of the other marks, and and I remember Mr. Falvey saying, why, why don't you quit school and get a job, and uh, the other thing, no, nobody quit school, you know, you you get beat to death, you know, but you 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 want you want you want quitting school, so we had to go to school, and now now it's it's there's a war developing, and all my classmates all my classmates are. Uh, Joining the army, go, going to war, and I, I, I'm left. With kind of, I remember there was kind of two of us left. Some of you might remember the story. Enoch, o, Enoch Odell Woodhouse Jr., who led the Boston School Boy, the, the big thing every year. The Boston schools, when they had wonderful things in the school system, like cadet training, which was kind of, which was good, I thought. And every junior high school and high school, you'd have these cadets. The girls would love it. They'd see this big parade in June when all the boys from all the junior highs and the high schools would be marching by the Boston Common. And it was a big thing that year that uh, Enoch Woodhouse led the Boston. That was the front page of the Globe, the Herald, and the Traveler. 
this black guy leading the Boston schoolboy cadets up up uh, up uh, Tremont Street in front of the front of the front of the commons. Well, Enoch and I graduate, graduated together. By the time I graduated, I really didn't know which way to turn in my life. Uh, what, was a, what was a guidance counselor? Maya Falvey was the guidance counselor. And Mishai, he spent more time next door in the, in the shoemaker's shop where, they, where everybody room was, but there was a bottle back there. But, <laughs> but Mr. Mr. Falvey spent more time, and, and, and I didn't come from a Republican bourgeois family in Humboldt Avenue. And my parents were immigrants whom I, whom we were going to let come to school uh, to speak on our behalf. So I was meandering. I knew I was supposed to go to school. My chemistry teacher, I hated him then, but as I got older, I appreciated it. I said, if I listen, listened to Mr. Brown, I would have overcome some obstacles about entrance, uh, entrance into school. And I struggled at the time it came to school. But fortunately, by the grace of the war was on, and there were two important uh, uh, movements of young men in, in Roxbury at the time, two very important movements of young men back in the 30s and the early 40s. One was, one was called the Eagles and one was called the, the Panthers. And you were either, if you're an athlete, you were e either an eagle or, what were you, G? Eagle. <laughs> you were an eagle. You were an eagle. A little eagle. <laughs> you, you, were, you, were an, you were an eagle or a panther. And, and the center place was Madison Park, but the Panthers dominated Madison Park and the uh, Eagles dominated uh, the corner of Canard and Tremont by Dr. Lewis's drugstore. Well, that was where, where they hung out at. So I'm, I'm caught up in the environment. And during the war, my brother Vincent, who coached the Eagles, had gone to, gone to war. And a young guy from Camden Street, from Ebenezer Baptist Church, a student at Gordon College, thank God, uh, volunteered to coach the Eagles. And I didn't, know, I didn't know this man was an angel. I, I found out later on, God stuck an angel in Carter Playground. Carter Playground, now mm -hmm. taken over by eminent domain by Northeastern University. Carter Playground was the heart of, of central activities for black people for generation after generation after generation. And this guy, Sim V. Simpson Turner, came from a family of four boys, just like my house, came from a family of four boys, lived on Camden Street, is going to Gordon College, loves sports, loves sports, and he volunteered to coach the Eagles. I didn't know that God had, I didn't know then that God had put him there for one reason, to save me from some stupid mistakes I was getting ready to make. Mm. I applied for school, and every school, every school I applied for, conservatory, Suffolk, Gordon College, all four schools I applied for, all of them gave me a hard time, told me I had to make up some credits, this wasn't satisfactory, and I got tired of it. After, after a while, I said, later mm. for this, and I looked at the, went the, looked in the paper, found this job, and I went to National Biscuit Company in Cambridge and started making money. First paycheck, I bought a new zoot suit. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a chain hanging down, started buying <laughs> records, and started letting Billy Rayner take me to parties. Oh. And Simpson Turner got a hold of me one day. Simpson Turner got a hold of me one day and said, this is not God's plan for your life. And this, this man hung with me. He intervened at the schools. He hung with me. And one day he said, I'm going to take you to meet a man. And he took me on the, on the trolley. He went out, to, went out to the Cleveland Circle trolley out Beacon Street and took me out to the New England School of Theology and introduced me to a man that he had already talked to about me. And this man says, uh, his records, he had a couple of units he's lacking. Uh, have him go to Harvard Extension and make up these credits at night, I'll pay the bill. He bought the books. A man from Port Clyde, Maine, by the name of Guy Linwood Vanna. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life. And this, this, this man put me on a track. Simpson Turner stayed on this track. He graduated. And he graduated from Gordon College and went to New York for graduate school, became a pastor in New York. When I got ready to go to graduate school, he opened the door of graduate school for me, watched over my life. And if it wasn't for him, I would have muffed. I would have, I would have must the, the clothes and the records and my brother Douglas and running around with Roy instead of going, to, instead of going to my mother's church, you know, mm. I just would, I would, I would have lost my sense of direction. Mm. And uh, then, then the music came, then the music came. I got an opportunity of, of being, uh, being in a, in a Christian quartet with these three theological students, all white, and uh, they needed, they, they needed a tenor. And I got put in, and I had the opportunity of traveling uh, half of the country until they got an invitation to go to North Carolina and, uh, in the 1940s and, 
and they were told you're going to have to leave the colored kid home. And this was in the 1940s. But all that opened all these doors for me in the theological schools, theological opportunities, and, and the rest of that story became history. But finding my way, uh, I've always been sympathetic to see students. I heard the, uh, the, dean, the dean of, uh, I think it was Fisk University one time, talking about the C students. Now, I'm, I'm, I, I have a son in my family who's an A, an honors student, you know, and I look at, look at his grades and stuff, but I'm a C student. Anybody here ever been a C student? <laughs> <laughs> so, and and I, I struggled with this. I mean, I, I struggled with, I had to, supposed to take Greek and Hebrew. Well, the Greek nearly sent me to, nearly sent me to Mattapan. I, I had to have a tutor to help me get, get through Greek, and I, bypa and I bypassed the Hebrew. Mm. But, uh, but so, tre tremendous opportunity for education. But the thing that I learned out of it later on, I got involved in assisting black young people uh, gain education. Uh, I had never been below the Mason-Dixon line. My first invitation to go below the Mason-Dixon line came in 1954, outside of 12 Baptist Church on the steps of the Robert Bruce Shaw House, uh, when a young man working on his PhD, who had just completed his work, and asked me if I would come to Montgomery, Alabama, and be his minister, minister to youth. And I said to, to Martin, ML, I said, uh, I, ML, I've never been below the Mason-Dixon line. And I never went below the Mason-Dixon line until the younger member of my family got accepted at Delaware State College. And I went, to, went, down, to, went down to Dover, Delaware, and experienced my first, my first issue of discrimination, not being allowed to eat in the, in the uh, Dover, Delaware, Howard Johnson's uh, restaurant, but then I got involved at Norfolk House uh, with uh, trying to work projects with junior, junior high school kids, particularly black young people, but not just black young people, junior high school kids from the Timothy School and other junior highs to put them on a track for education. And, and we, Jeep assisted me, we started the first, uh, the first taking kids on tours of the CIAA colleges in the South. To, a project I got to work on in Norfolk House, but that's another story. Mm. That's t t t tell us uh, about your meeting Martin King at 12. <clears throat> uh, one Sunday, uh, I think probably it was a Thursday night, when Reverend Hester told me that uh, one of his friend's sons, one of his friend's sons was, was, gonna, was, was, was coming to Boston uh, to work on his PhD. I had already known and learned and uh, I, I think I heard you making comments on this. I had already learned and known uh, that there was a, a, a track, not an underground railroad, but a direct railroad out of, out of the educational centers of the south to the, to the northeast, because that's another story in itself that's very important mm -hmm. for history. I'll just throw some names out there. Uh, somebody has got to do some studies on, on, on Beulah Shepherd Hester. Anybody who's been to North Carolina to college knows who the shepherds are if you've been to college, black college in North Carolina. Her, her family's founders of, of, of colleges and graduates, uh, graduate schools. But this whole, whole thing of uh, being south and coming north. But at Breezy Meadows Camp, which Mrs. Kester sent me to when I, and my brothers when I was eight years old, that's my first exposure to black men and women who had studied in the black colleges of the South. And it, I, I can look back, a guy named Phil Medley. Anybody here remember Phil Medley? They, they went to Columbus Avenue Zion. Phil Medley, you know, these guys that went to these black colleges in the South. It was a whole new thing for a kid who'd never been below the Mason looks like. Because I, I never had a black teacher. There were no black teachers in the Boston school system during, during my tenure. Now, I never had a black teacher in theological school. I had white teachers all my life, you know. Uh, and somebody told me this was wrong with me. I didn't have any black teachers. <laughs> but uh, 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 Ma 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 Martin's, Martin's coming here to the north, and I had been ex exposed to these black guys and gals at, at the Robert Goose Shaw House camp. They would be the counselors coming in, working some. This would be in the 30s, and, and, and the 30s. And these black guys would come, and they, they, do, they wrote music. They did, boy, all, I wasn't exposed to any of that stuff. And I was being exposed to it at Breezy Meadows. Uh, Breezy Meadows was getting done later on when I became a counselor at Breezy Meadows. I meet all these guys and gals coming from the colleges, coming from the, uh, the colleges in the South. So Dr. Hester said that, uh, that 
uh, his friend's son was coming up to Boston University to work on a PhD, PhD, and he would be joining him in the pulpit. And I remember the first Sunday that he came, 12 Baptist Church was on Charmant Avenue. Uh, it, it would be right adjacent to the land that the, land that the BRA and all them people are arguing about right now, Mount Near Castle Boulevard. That would have been 12 Baptist Church's site after it moved from up here on Beacon Hill over there. I remember the, the first Sunday he came, and Reverend Hester had him preach. And uh, I came to a, a swift conclusion that, uh, Reverend Hester, please don't ask me to preach any Sunday morning when this guy is going to be here. <laughs> 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 but it's different. His parents didn't come from Barbados so <laughs> with an eighth grade and a ninth grade education. Uh, he come from a, a whole line of educated, educated black preachers on the cutting edge of civil rights. He'd already been to Crozier Theological Seminary. He'd already got, a, he already got his... Uh, Got his uh, divinity work done there, and he's going to work on a work on a PhD from a northern uni uni university that would give him the credentials he needed to do the mission that God was calling him to in life, and uh, that, that was a, a, a first relationship. Oftentimes on Thursday nights, I guess Thursday might have mis been Mrs. Hester's half day at the Shaw House. I'm not sure because on, often on Thursday nights she would invite students. She had two nieces, two nieces of her own that had come from North Carolina that was studying, doing graduate work at Boston. Now, there's an awful lot of blacks from uh, southern colleges doing their master's works and their doctor's work at the colleges around, mainly, mainly Boston University. Somebody ended up in Tufts, a whole group of them. So the ones from North Carolina would uh, gravitate to, uh, to the Hester House on a Thursday night. And uh, of course, now with Dr. King there being as popular as he was when he came here, being a Morehouse graduate, they had their own sense of fraternity and being an alpha. Uh, in that fraternity, and all the alpha guys, all, all the alpha guys in the Boston, they just jump. Uh, he's our man. He's our, He may be working in your church, but he's our man, uh, kind of thing, kind of thing. So there was this gravitation. So we 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 we, we became close. Uh, he was two years younger than I, and by degrees, two degrees ahead of me. And so uh, I was a starter, and so we developed developed this relationship. And I think it's important to say that there were two. There were three people, but two people that were princi principals in the factor in 12th Baptist Church. A lady by the name of Barbara Wright had retired. She was a school teacher. She'd come to Boston. And uh, Mary, Mary Powell, a relative of, of Dr. Benjamin Mays, uh, her work had sent her around the world. And she ended up coming into Boston with job opportunities. And she was working. She was studying at Conservatory of Music and uh, part-time. And she was working part-time uh, for Mrs. Hester and Reverend Hester as a secretary, Mary Powell a name not to be forgotten. She hasn't got her dues in Boston. She ended up a latter part of her career uh, uh, doing a lot of humanitarian civil rights work in the Boston area. But she was close to the Kings. She was a relative of Benjamin Mays. She, she was Martin's contact with this Boston world and, 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 with, and with, the, with the academic world. And uh, Mary Powell was kind of important because she got me one of the, she got me she, she's the one who's responsible for, for me having a job at, at uh, Norfolk Health Center, which was seven of the most exciting working years of my life to work in an institution when someone said, you plan the programs, we'll get you the money uh, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I had this opportunity, but Mary Powell got me the job. Mary Powell was a very brilliant, brilliant, talented woman. Mary was the woman that Dr. King went to when he, after he had taken out a number of girls in 12 Baptist Church and some other girls at BU and it wasn't ob obviously... Uh, tremendously attractive to them. He went to Mary and said, aren't there, are there any other girls here that could meet my fancy? It's something words to that effect. And she was the one that said, oh, I've got just a girl for you, because she was studying at Conservatory of Music. But um, uh, Barbara Wright uh, was the babysitter for the King children back in Atlanta when they were all little. She used to tell all the stories of, all the bad stories of, of, about the King children. <laughs> she was the baby, she was their babysitter, and she was suddenly here. So forever, when Martin, came, when Martin came to Boston, usually I would get a call if he didn't have time uh, concerning Barbara, how was Barbara doing, and, and how, was, uh, how was Mary Powell. Some of you may know Mary Powell. She became quite, a, quite an activist in, in, in the city and the town. She was a brilliant lady. She had one son who was named after, named after Martin, Michael, Michael Powell. I don't know. He's around somewhere. I've lost track on him. But uh, Mary, Mary uh, had a breakdown of health and uh, came under a lot of stress, and she, she, she backed away a little bit from the kings. Those who went to his funeral know that she was sitting right with the king family 
during Martin's funeral. But she was the closest tie. She was deepest tie. One of the ties, one of the concerns, because Coretta would be ever grateful uh, to her because that's how Coretta met met Martin. Martin would be ever grateful because she was son of an open door for him in so many things in, in this area, and mm -hmm. she was the one that that. Uh, Taught, uh, told him about, about Coretta. Well, you served in the legislature and um, introduced Dr. King um, before he spoke. What was that like? That was great. That was great. That was a, a very significant day. Uh, I, had, I had a lot of responsibilities that, at, at that time because uh, uh, I, I was asked to be uh, coordinator for trans where he went and how he went for safety, for transportation and security. I had, had to work with the police. You know, they, 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 they designated a group of black police to be, to be with him at all times. Uh, There's a fellow from Concord Baptist Church. I think his name was Weaver, Weaver Police Department, officer named Weaver that was attached to stay with him at all times and all places. And, uh, and I was a part of the team. Uh, the invitation was given. I think the, I think the, the first approach for his invitation to the state house, uh, I think, came from Frank Colgate. Uh, Frank, Frank was state rep before me. Frank and I, Frank and I grew up together. We were, we were almost relatives. A lot of people didn't know it politically when they used to see us with political campaigns. Well, we grew up together. Our parents were like, were, were like relatives, and uh, Frank and I became political competitors. But we were very, 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 very close. But Frank got the idea. Said, "Mike, do, do you think he'll come?" I said, I, "I'm pretty sure he will." And uh, so Royal, Royal Bolin and Frank and myself sent a petition to the legislature. Some legislators did not vote for it, but wouldn't go on record. They didn't want to be recorded as not voting for it. Some legislators didn't want him coming, but none, none to my knowledge, my memory, none of them, none of them publicly uh, stated it. And he was thrilled with this because he said, Mike, this is the first invitation I've got to a legislative body. By this time, he fully understand, even better than I, the importance of being able to move legislators. He also recognized that this is Kennedy country. This is Kennedy country. If I get the Massachusetts legislature uh, to, to listen to me and hear me and recognize me, I'll be, I'll be on my way to be able to crack doors at other legislative bodies throughout the, throughout the nation. That was a big day. I, it was a, a lot of heavy responsibility, a lot of things I, uh, that, that I had to do along with it. Uh, Andy Young was the liaison uh, for me, but that was a, a great day. The, the, State House was packed. Uh, there were a lot of, lot of non-colored people that weren't happy about his being there, just like, uh, sort of similar to like sticking a guy in the White House. Uh, the, a lot of folks just couldn't, couldn't understand this black man coming to talk about these, these black issues. But the Speaker of the House, uh, Speaker Davrin, was very, very open to it. And, and, the, and, the, and, and, and the, uh, the, the party leader, Bob Quinn, some of these guys were strongly open to this not only to have Dr. King there, but to hear and deliberate on the, mess on the, message, that, the message that he was bringing. Uh, Martin was thrilled for the opportunity to be in, and he, he wrote it in his book, this, this, uh, this is a new first time experience for me in this country. I want to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, we have a microphone, so if anyone would like to ask questions. Right here. I think I can do louder. I just want to know. We want to record it. Thank you. The experience that you had had um, with the legislature, did that open up the avenue for you to become the spiritual advisor to the Kennedy family? To the Kennedy family. To the Kennedy family? To part of the Kennedy family. <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the Ted Kennedy family. I, I, I would say, uh, I don't know if. I don't know if I would call it spiritual advisor, because there, I'm certain that, that Ted had Ted had available any any group of outstanding uh, advisors for him. And recall it while I was in the legislature, the the chaplain of the legislature was uh, Cardinal Cushion's number one man, uh, graduate of uh, 44, 1944 football star from Boston College. His name will come to me. I'm 85 years old, three months of these names that lose my head. But the chaplain of the House of Representatives is very, very close uh, to the entire King family here. But uh, I was, I, I did have opportunity of sharing with the King family and uh, the 
King family, with the, with the Ted Kennedy family on a number, num, number of instances. More. I think I was more an advisor about certain things relating to church, Protestantism, and the black church than I was a spiritual advisor to him, although there was one time when I did have an opportunity of being a spiritual advisor to him. This was in his second, during his second marriage, uh, to be able to pray with him. But th this did, did bring me in a fairly close relationship with the, with the Kennedy family and, and with Joe and Ted in particular. And uh, the, the brother Michael had died and a number of them. Of course, then they utilized 12 Baptist Church choir and music groups on a number of occasions for a number of their affairs. Reverend, thank you for all that you've contributed and all that you've given and in the inspiration that you are. Right now in this world, there seems to be such a lack of civility. And I'm wondering if you could comment on what's missing now. A very, very good question. I've been, in recent days, telling folk that I've talked with that the, the climate of the country and the climate of the world troubles me. Uh, there are just so many factors interplaying in our world right now that could, uh, could really put us in, a, in an Armageddon, actually, when you, when you look at it. And I, I looked at things from a theological point of view I'm a Christian, and uh, I try to respect those that have other religious persuasions. Uh, but uh, I, when you when you when you when you when you take an ultimate authority out of the out of the picture, your your, your world's in trouble. I remember the day of the nomination the day of the nomination of uh, Obama for the presidency. I was at Mass General for some treatments that day, and I came from the hospital over the shopping mall here. Charles River Park, and I had my radio on in my car, and I, and, and I, I, heard, I was listening to a radio broadcast, and I was so shocked by the things that I was hearing from a Massachusetts radio broadcaster, it troubled my heart, and it stayed in my mind throughout this whole presidency. And, uh, and I, my, my prayer was that, God, would you keep this man, keep this young man safe, through this presidency from the things that, I, that I've, I've heard, the, the, the threats, the threats that I heard in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, but all, our country, I have problems sometimes in my, in my Christian faith. To give you a little twist on this, I went to so-called evangelical schools, went to three so-called evangelical schools. I have no regrets about it. Look back on now. This is where God wanted me to be at that time, and and it did me tremendous good personally in my own personal spiritual life. But one of those evangelical schools, I had serious problems of race, and this wasn't below the Mason Dixon. I'm in New York City. I'm in New York City. I had serious problems of race, serious problems of race, enough to make me to make me uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater. But my, my, my mother, whose faith was deeper and greater than mine, used to have saying, I'm glad I know Jesus for myself. And in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the campaign that's going on now, I get troubled when I hear some people who, with whom I share religious faith saying things that, that, that would uh, hurt a certain category, whether it be poor people, whether people on welfare, my mother got off of welfare soon. Mrs. McGarry, Johnny McGarry's mother got off of welfare. My Irish buddy's mother, my mother got off of welfare. And all due respect to the late Representative Ayanello that I had to ch chase all the time in the legislature about talking about uh, those, those women that don't want to go to work. Well, there, there were some welfare women that did want to go to work and would, would, would get a job. But the Things that are being said by some people for political gain that could hurt a, a race or a category of people, or even 
a religious group of religious group of people. Uh, God has allowed me to be in a family with where we all all religious sort of impact, and I and I and, and regardless of how how right wing my my own Christian faith may be, I, I got to respect everybody else. I I I have so Salims and Abdi's in my family, you know, mm -hmm. and. I'm, I'm, I'm caught in this kind of situation. One of my, one of my leaders, one of my, one of my religious leaders, uh, I, I, I said, I, I have Muslims in my family. And, and, and what, you, what, what, what you have said, what you have said publicly, doesn't, doesn't help them understand Christianity at all. And I say the same thing to some of the political, political leaders. We're in a turmoil. I said to someone today, the God of money, I mean, the God of money, what some corporations? Someone called me tonight. They're, he's, they're on here tonight because they're having trouble with their with their bank and their mortgage. And, and the, the 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 god of money, the god of power, the god of racism, all of these things are cropping up again. And the, the whole money situation, uh, with what's going on in the, the 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 army official that's been on television last night speaking about uh, things that he's seen in Afghanistan and how troubled he is. I'm, I'm sure the government, the White House, is going to contact him and say, "Shut up!" Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the military leader is saying that he's in pain, he's troubled by what's happening in Afghanistan and and the Israel, the Israel Iran possibility, and all, all these terrible things that could uh, take a, a confused, messed up world and make it all the all the more messed up. Where is where is there an answer uh, for peace? Where is there an answer for 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 Humanitarian respect. Uh, the, the, the world, the world's in, in chaos, and, and there are some people that are more concerned about their political uh, gains than they are about the welfare of the nation or the welfare of people. I think we're in a troubled time. Uh, um, uh, Giselle Bunchen, is that the right name? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I'm not going to say pray, pray for the pray for the Patriots to win. I'm going to pray for our nation. Pray for a nation right now that uh, I think we're at a time where, as I said one time, the Jesus I read about and know about, the, the, the faith that I follow, uh, didn't discriminate with, with communism, uh, Democrats, Republicans. Uh, you know, he cared about people. He cared about people beyond, beyond this border. Beyond the, and uh, the nation's in trouble. We're in trouble economically. There's still people, in spite of the fact that there are jobs out there, still people struggling, still people struggling to find, find jobs. Our agencies, are, the agencies that serve our community are being cut terribly. Uh, I'll, th I'll throw this out there. Part of the, the agencies, I told people one time that the Robert Bruce Shaw House, this is dangerous, the Robert Bruce Shaw House and Breezy Meadows Camp did more for me that I could envision than church did for me. <laughs> was, you know, and, and, and I watch these. Does that make sense, Mark? Amen. You understand that? You know, it, but I, I watch. That, that's why I try to be a pastor in a church that cares about what's going on in people. You know, whether it be a thrift shop or uh, you know, how do we how do we care about people? There's so much hurting. There's so much hurting, and I, and I watch the Shaw House get shot. I, I watch the people with power say we're going to withhold money from here. And here is the salvation of, of groups of people, here. And, and, and I'm seeing this now, and, 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 and I, I watch our nation, I watch our nation throw away big hunks of money trying to appease countries that are their enemies. And, and my children are hurting. I listen, to, I listen to Helen Davis, the late Helen Davis, the property that she owned on Warren Street, when she got the notice that it's being taken and she fixed up all this property so that uh, people of color could have some decent apartments to live in, then she got this notice that it was all being taken. And let me take on another, on another thing. I've asked, I have asked God if he would give me enough strength and health for a, 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 a double cancer survivor here, enough strength and health to be able to Finish my scribbling, Chris Lydon's over there looking at me. Finish my scribbling on, on, on uh, the strategic sh strip. 
the strategic strip, you know, Vernon Street, Vernon Street, Tremont Street, from Vernon Street down to Mass Avenue. You know, um, and I, I had a difficult, I, I probably almost had a mental breakdown trying to deal, trying to figure out how to deal with, with, uh, with, with gentrification and regentrification. You know, and for a while it was really upsetting me. I was getting, I found myself getting angry that, that the shrines, let me give another, that the shrines were gone. Let me give an example. One day, did you go with me to visit Breezy Meadows one day? Down down to Holliston? I started to take Abd down to see Breezy Meadows. So we went to Breezy Meadows, we're walking all around what was left of the Holliston, Massachusetts uh, camp. And uh, then a lady came and started telling me, she said that she was from the, she didn't say monastery, the, 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 the Catholic women's conference center on this ground. She said, this is sacred ground. And I said, my dear, this was sacred ground long before you got here. <laughs> and I told her about what happened in Breezy Meadows camp. I said, Mrs. Hester comes to my house and say, Mrs. Haynes, I'm going to send you boys to Breezy Meadows camp. We're on welfare. We have no money. My mother, some kids, rich kids' mothers would send them $5 a week. My mother sent, sent a dime. I used to go behind cabin two to open my letters because my mother would have a dime with some scotch tape. <laughs> she sent us a, a dime. Some of the other kids in the camp, uh, the, what's his name? Oh, boy, I can't think. T Tyrell, Bunny Tyrell? Bunny, to, Bunny Terrell, Bunny Terrell will get a check. <laughs> my mother had a, a, a dime, or a scotch taped on a letter <laughs> to a baby <laughs> in Breezy Meadows, Breezy Meadows camp. But I watch all of these things disappear. And, and, and I, get restless with, I get restless with the power brokers that become insensitive to the, to, to the to the masses and to the needs of the masses. I watch, I watch Norfolk House go, I watch Shaw House go, I, watch, I, I oppose Shaw House. The only, one that, the only one that really fought Shaw House was Mrs. Hester. She fought it and they virtually kicked her out. And uh, Mr. Shelburne said he wasn't fighting anymore. And there's a lady lying in a nursing home on the Ponset Avenue today, lying in a nursing home. She must be 93 years old. Watson. Mrs. Kath, Kath, Kathy Watson, lying in a nursing home. Her entire career, her entire, she's the one that helped me learn. I didn't go, go to school of journalism. Kathy Watson used to, when I was writing for the, for the, for the, for the Bay State Band, Kathy used to check my stuff for me. You've got to change it. You've got to correct this. You've got to correct this. And this lady fought it. She fought, she fought the loss of Shaw House, Roxbury Naval House, and, and Norfolk House fought it, fought it, a, a real tragedy. And uh, the lives that have been helped, the guys and gals that were helped get to school, stay in school, get a scholarship through Shelburne and all these, all those agencies, we lost them. We, we, we lost them. You, you come up Tremont Street and you, you, you pass by Butler's Hall. I, I told the new president of Northeastern University. I said, do you know that Marcus Garvey preached in Northeastern University. He said, what do you mean? I said, you, take, you just took over the hall where he preached, Marcus Garvey. I didn't know, but I, I got to know, understand Marcus Garvey when I got older. Yeah. I didn't when I was younger. When I was young, I didn't, what's all, this, what's all this fussing about? I understood it when I got older. And I said, do you, do you, do you realize Marcus Garvey spoke here? <coughs> you realize this is where, this is where Farrakhan Farrah, uh, Farrah had his first concert on, in, in Northeastern? You've taken over the land. No, and, and kind of playground, uh, kind of playground. Jack Crump, uh, Jack. The, the 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 name of the the name of the Madison Park uh, football field was Jack Crump football field. Jack Crump wanted his ashes to be thrown on kind of playground. I begged his wife not to do it. I said, because changing times are changing. I begged her not to do it. I said, when your kids get older, they want to go see the grave with their father. Well, they did it, and when they started digging up digging up kind of. They, 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 after it happened, a year after they had a, a football game to commemorate Jack Crump, and his son, the youngest son, whose name is Michael, started crying, Mommy, they're running all over Daddy. They're running all over Daddy. I told the president of Northeastern, I said, that ground is sacred. 
And I said that the, the ultimate of Carta Playground was this was the congregating meeting place for Dr. King's March on, March on Boston, Carta Playground. And half of those, 5% of those students don't have a clue about the, 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 the history of, of that entire strip to the, black, to the black community. To lose it is dangerous. I, I've, Chris Lydon and I, I said, to lose it is dangerous. This history has to be recorded. You know, top of, our top jazz stars come from off of Tremont Street. Leading jazz stars there, great history. Reverend Haynes, thank you for everything you say and do and are. Uh, but you just take the words out of my mouth about, you were mentioning Cunard Street, which was the place where Harry Carney grew up, mm -hmm. and Hammond Street across Tremont was where Johnny Hodges grew up. Right. They went on for Harry Carney, I think, 50 years. Johnny Hodges, more than 40 years. They were the low reed in the Ellington Orchestra and the high reed, and they'll never be equaled again, I mean, as long as the world goes on. But I think it's one of my great, um, I feel a certain responsibility that there should be a monument uh, uh, on Tremont Street to those men. I think Johnny Hodges is the greatest musician that um, came out of Austin in the 20th century. Um, that's a, I, I've had that argument with people. Gunther Schuller says, well, you, know, you could consider Leonard Bernstein a Boston guy too. He says the difference is that Leonard Bernstein wrote some great things, um, some not so great things, West Side Story, the soundtrack of On the Waterfront, but every note that Johnny Hodges played was perfect for 45 years with the Ellington Band. It seems to me that should be somehow better known and there should be some statue or something in Boston to, to those men. Well, I would, I would respond to you this way, Chris, that there are, if you just took Tremont Street from Mass Avenue and come up to what was Vernon Street, you know, where, where, where Concord Baptist was in a hall upstairs in the corner of Vernon Street, Concord Baptist. And you start there and you come all the way down and you see the institutions and the people, the classic musicians, the William Rhodes Opera Society, and, and on and on and on, uh, the, the cultural classical stuff. Um, and it's, it's, it's all being, it's all being, all being, all being, being, being lost. Carter Playground is history. Who's, who's William Carter? What took place on these grounds? The, 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 Negro, the Negro Baseball League. I, I, I said to Beverly earlier that, that uh, I had spoke with the president of Northeastern. I said, you, you have a debt to do something and leave something here that records, records some of the history. There were, there were one, two, three, four black-owned, four black-owned drug stores on that strip. You start at Dr. Lewis, the corner of Canard Street. You come up to, uh, to, Fred to Frederick Douglass Square. You have, uh, you have Noel Jackson and his wife who did the, one of the first uh, black radio, radio show people, right? Am I not right? Yeah. Yeah. Her wife, and, you, 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 and the corner, Mr. Gideon, the corner of Hammond, corner of Hammond and, uh, and, and, and Cabot Street. He moved, to, he moved, moved from there to, to Seattle, Washington. And you come up the next corner, it wasn't black owned, but it was black managed. You had Mrs. Williams up until, from People's Baptist Church up until just a few years ago when she died. But you had these enterprises. You had the first, the first, first black electrical engineer, Barbara Dawson's mother. Give me a name, come on, help me. My, Lomax. Mr. Lomax, and ran a top shelf, first class, clean, clean the window every week business. <laughs> clean the window every week. Selling, selling, he wasn't only an electrical engineer, certified electrical engineer, but he was selling appliances in the 1930s and 40s. Am I not right? Right there, right there, right there on Tremont Street. You have this array of outstanding doctors along, along that strip on Tremont Street. Musicians, musicians, uh, some of the classical music, most of them are dying out, some of these classical musicians around, all studied right there on Tremont Street. And on and on the beat goes and on. Top, I, I sold newspapers at age 12. My corner was the corner of Hammond, Hammond and, and Tremont in front of Slade's after I delivered to my customers. After I delivered to my customers. Renner Slade's, who started at the corner of 
uh, Warwick and Warwick and Hammond Street and a little house storefront, and then moved to and and this was a restaurant that served an entire community. People standing in line sometimes. You go up one but uh, from his from his barbecue chicken or roasted chicken, you go up the next corner to, to Estelle's to their fried chicken. White tablecloths on the tables. People standing in line. People of all colors standing in line to get into get into Estelle's. In all, you have that whole historic strip, and the, the nightclubs along that strip, the musicians that came, every top musician. I, 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 I can see Sammy Davis Jr. standing outside of Estelle's. Jimmy Gilbert said after he got his hair done in Jimmy Gilbert's barbershop, Jimmy said, <laughs> just stand, standing, standing outside of Estelle's. And all, all his kids standing around to look at the car that, that Sammy Davis Jr. is driving in. Historic, historic strip. And the history is, uh, Chris Lyons says it's going to be my fault if it goes by the board, but the, that the history is going by, going by the board. Mm -hmm. I talked with, with Northeastern about doing it, and, and Joe, Dr. Joe Warren was working with me and a few others to try to call this. I don't know, they've got a lot of pictures and stuff, they've got some research that was done, but Joe's sudden death, and the university has not been able to get all this stuff together. I suggested to Beverly, I said, maybe it's time for a partnership between Northeastern University and the African Meeting House, because the African Meeting House doesn't have the resource of, of money that Northeastern's able to get. And I, I've discovered this, I may be wrong, uh, maybe, maybe Hubie, maybe Hubie can, uh, can help me with this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was you, Hubie. I, I, I may be wrong, this, but uh, I, it appears that you, Northeastern University can get money for anything it wants to get money for, if it wants to get the money for it. When I look at that high rise, that, that high rise that's, that's, that's in the right dead in the middle of, middle of Rump, they moved Ruggles Street just so they could build a high rise there. That's not Ruggles Street. They pushed Ruggles Street off. The, the high rise is right on Ruggles Street. And I said, the, there's a rich history that's going down the tubes that the university, that the university has, to, has, to, uh, has to record. I, I rode past Lena Park the other day. I looked at Lena Park clothes and I, I, and, and something in my spirit got angry. Something in my spirit got angry. I said, uh, they turned over the assets of Breezy Meadows Camp to Lena Park. It's gone down the chute. It's gone down the chute. And uh, we, we, we have these wonderful institutions that, that touch lives, sent lives. I can see John Shelburne sitting on a bench. I can see John Shelburne sitting on a bench in the camp that he watched over, trying to tell some guy how they could get to school. Offering me a job. Mike, you're going to go to school? You're going to school of theology? I'll give you a summer job. Every summer, I'll give you a job. Encourage me to school. And, and same with Beulah Shepherd Hester. Something needs to happen in this town. I'm going to say one other thing before the time goes by <laughs> that's been on my head. Every time I ride up Melanie Cass Boulevard, I've been trying to write a thing. Everybody in my family knows it. I've been trying to write a thing. It's called This Gold and Them Thy Hills. And it's just uh, my, in 19... I had, I had Breezy Meadows Camp uh, from the time I was 16, uh, and I ended up being the program director. And uh, so I knew all the, all the, all the poor kids in, 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 in Orchard Park and, and Woodrow Wilson Court. And what, in 1951, when I went to be minister of the youth part-time at 12th Baptist Church, like my father, I always had two jobs. I was the parole board, the church, and I always did two things. You know? and, uh, but 1951, my first project was to concentrate on the kids from Woodrow Wilson Court. And when I look back on it and I reflect, I reflect what has come out of Woodrow Wilson Court alone. I said, Haynes, you've got, you, you got to write this. And today when I passed that, that beautiful, that beautiful uh, yellow-orange school over there, you know what I say every time I pass it? I say two things. Two names, two names come off my lips. Every time I pass that school, Ruth Batson. Every time I pass it, every time I pass that school, I said, that's where Ruth Batson lived. Woodrow, that's where she started when they were living in Woodrow. That was a segregated corner of the project. All the black folk were confined to Woodrow Wilson Court, to that corner. And you see what happened there? Ruth Batson, Dr. Dr. Ronald Leslie Donkett, the head of clinical psychology at Howard University Medical Center, a neurosurgeon uh, Frederick Buddy Washington, that the, the head of the medical school at BU said he would never, never amount to anything. She wouldn't let him in BU. He got on Howard University. Uh, the, the 
President Clinton's major advisor on, on Africa and Somalia, uh, McPherson. What's your first name? Somebody help me on McPherson. McPherson. Hazel. Hazel. Hazel McPherson. Hazel McPherson. Breezy Meadows girl. Breezy, Meadow, Breezy Meadows girl. When you see what came out of Woodrow Wilson Court alone, not Bobby Brown's mother. You know, Bobby Brown's mother come, <laughs> my man mother come out of Woodrow Wilson Court too. You know, the, 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 that's a plus or minus. But when, when you look at that court, and every time I pass, I said, that's where Ruth Batson started her battle. I said, that school, Ruth Batson, Orchard Park, K-2 School. Somebody see that her name gets on it. Mm. Well, on that note, it seems to me to be extremely appropriate um, as Ruth Batson was one of the founders of the Museum of African American History um, to first of all thank the Honorable Reverend Michael E. Haynes. <laughs> As you can tell from uh, this conversation, we have only scratched the surface of what he knows about the history of Boston, what he has achieved as a father, pastor, husband, um, uh, commissioner of fair housing, um, uh, state representative, um, um, the, the many, many roles he has played over the course of his life. Uh, part of what um, I heard in my conversation with Reverend Haynes was very much a connection with the history that began here at the African Meeting House, a history of activism and entrepreneurs and education. Um, people want to know often what happened between this abolitionist movement and today. Um, the connections are clear. People continued on struggling and moving with their lives and attempting to change things for the better. Um, we need to record this 20th century history and connect it to this 18th and 19th century history. History in, the history of Boston is rich and replete from 1638 to today of people of African descent who have made this nation um, be the democracy it said that it wanted to be. I want to thank Reverend Haynes for continuing the tradition of the Reverend Thomas Paul, the first pastor at this, the African Baptist Church throughout his life. As many have said before, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you. Um, <laughs>